what a difference a week makes. We are not in the parlor. Uh, I am sitting in an empty church. It is Friday the 13th. But my purpose is for us to continue our series with, uh, on the Book of Common Prayer and how we get our theology from our prayer book. If there was an overarching theme in this adult formation series, it would be the Latin phrase, lex orende, lex credendi, as we pray, so we believe. If you were in the parlor with me for the first Sunday of this series, you will recall that we teased out a theology of creation from the theology of the collects in the Book of Common Prayer that relate to creation. Last week, we teased out the theology, the prayer book understanding of what it means to be a human person created in the very image of the living God. And we use collects and prayers to illustrate the prayer book's doctrine of what it means to be human. Our topic this week is the topic of sin. What does the Book of Common Prayer teach us about the reality of human sin. And before I go much further with you this morning, I want to remind you that this, in one sense, we're building. Everything we say today does not in any way negate what we learned last week about the dignity of humanity made in God's image. O oh God who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. We're not leaving that theology. We're not forgetting that we learned that last week, but rather we are, with that theology as our foundation, we are beginning to look at the reality of human sin. I mentioned to some of you last week that when I was Bishop of Kentucky, I literally had met many people in my ministry there for 17 years who were so startled or distressed or confused by their own uh, an experience of their own sinfulness that they couldn't trust their baptism. And I've actually met people that have been baptized two, three, and four times. Uh, we Episcopalians uh, have a lot in common with our co-religionist of the 19th century, Oscar Wilde, who famously said, I can resist anything but temptation. The truth is, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that means me, that means you, that means all of us. We have that in common. I'll also remind you of the quip that I shared with you about the the elderly parishioner who decided towards the latter part of her life that she would engage the rector's Bible study. And so she went to her first Bible study and at the end, apparently, she was heard to have said to the rector, uh, oh, rector, I certainly did enjoy your Bible study and I'm loving the Bible. It reminds me so much of the Book of Common Prayer. Well, before I take us to the prayer book this morning, um, I would like to begin uh, our conversation about the reality of human sin with a very, very familiar parable. I'm in the 15th chapter of Luke. Uh, in the 15th chapter of Luke, uh, we begin with this accusation that is hurled against Jesus. It's an amazingly important place to begin. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners, and what's even worse, he has table fellowship with them. He eats with them. And in response to that accusation against Jesus that is hurled by um, the tax, uh, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus, always trying to move the Pharisees and the scribes out of their righteousness, out of their isolating self-righteousness, he loves the scribes and the Pharisees, and he loves them enough 
to invite them uh, into a new way of seeing God and God's property, which is always to have mercy. He wants to invite them into seeing that, so he tells three parables. Um, the first parable is about a shepherd who uh, had, was lucky enough, effective enough, competent enough to have 99 sheep in the sheepfold at the end of the day of grazing them in the pasture. That would have been a tremendous number of sheep to have been able to bring in safely. And yet, this weird shepherd, this atypical shepherd, cannot rest as long as he knows that one of the sheep is missing. So he risks his uh, boss's fortune, he risks the, uh, the 99 that are safe for the one that is lost, and, and goes and finds the lost sheep and brings it back. Then to intensify his teaching that God, his father, is a God whose property is always to have mercy. And of course, I'm deliberately quoting the prayer book. He tells the parable of a woman who had 10 coins and, less, and lost one of them and diligently searches, uh, is searching with, absolute, with an absolute consuming desire to find the coin because it is so precious to her, it is so necessary to her, it is so important to her. And upon finding it, then uh, the desire for mercy, the desire to search and find, leads to a kind of communal rejoicing. She gets everybody together, I have found my coin. Uh, and then, so that was a one out of 10 loss. You see, the, uh, the, the amount of loss gets increasingly uh, more dramatic. And then the third parable, which is so familiar <coughs> to many of us, is the parable of the two lost sons. There was a man who had two sons, and you know this story. Uh, I hope you feed on this story in your life as I have fed on it in my life. I was doing a Bible study early in my ordained life, um, and there was a, um, a Lutheran missionary pastor who had spent all of his ministry in the Middle East, and he wrote a book called The Cross and the Prodigal. It changed my life when I was in my 20s and uh, being a parish priest, and it still informs my view of God to this very instant. But he pointed out that the parable is about two lost sons. And uh, you remember the story. There was a, a, a father who had two sons. Uh, the younger son said to the father, Father, uh, why don't you drop dead? That's in fact what he implied. He didn't say it directly, but he asked for his inheritance, which is to say the father was more important to him dead than, to al than alive. And the father, out of some sort of um, odd, in some ways, reaction, goes ahead and gives him his inheritance. He goes to a foreign land. He uh, wastes the money on riotous living. He is feeding pigs, which is a low point for any Jewish boy to be. He is uh, deep in the pig pen, and he has a memory. How many servants in my father's house have bread and to spare? Which is an amazing reality of abundance in a, very, in a place where commodities like food are so precious and so scarce. How many of my father's servants have bread and to spare? And then he concocts a plan and he concocts a confession. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. You remember this story. You remember how it escalates. He makes his way home. And then there was this amazing sentence in the story. And while he, he was still at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, we've heard the story so much, and we've not read the story in Greek, most of us, so uh, we hear that the father had compassion. Well, that's lovely. <clears throat> God's always busy having compassion, but the Greek word for compassion 
means that his guts hurt, his phlegizomai. It's where we get the English word spleen. His, he sees his son at a distance. And any of us who are parents or who have friends or who have um, anybody we've loved and their life has just suddenly been so messed up, we know that gut-wrenching worry. Uh, and it's an alert worry. It hurts us in our guts. Therefore, the father is sitting. He's alert. I imagine him just waiting pretty much every day in hope that maybe on the horizon he will see that longed-for vision of his missing child. And suddenly, while he was still at a distance, searching love, what George Herbert referred to as wide-eyed love, saw him. And rather than waiting till he crept home, rather than waiting for the confession, rather than saying, I am going to teach this young man the lesson of his life. There's none of that. There's property only to have mercy. So the father, upon seeing him, before he gets one step further, the father races, and the verb in Greek is to sprint, as in athletic competition. The father races and embraces him and kisses him, and the kissing is repeated repeatedly kissing him. And then, and only then, then and only then does the confession come out. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But note, note this. Note this about God, whose property is always to have mercy. Note this the last part of the confession that he had prepared in the pig pen is absolutely lost in the embrace with the father's arms around him, with the kiss, with the embrace, with the strength of that embrace, he dares not articulate the last part of his planned confession, which was treat me as one of your heart hired servants. He planned to say that, but he loses that phrase in the embrace because you just cannot say that as you're being embraced as the long, longed for son, as the longed for daughter, as the longed for child. We do not come back to God whose property is always to have mercy as anything other than the loved child that he has made and that he adores. So remember what I said earlier. We're not losing our theology of humanity made in God's image as we look at the phenomena of sin. Rather, given the fact that we are really loved to death, how do we as people who are made out of love and made for love face the truth of our sin in the larger reality that even in the midst of our sinfulness, we are still the chosen, the beloved, the cherished, the searched for, and the found children of the living God known to us in Jesus Christ. So even though this is a prayer book study, I wanted to, I wanted to give this context. I wanted to give this context uh, before we look at a very important piece of the prayer book that not a lot of us look at enough, and certainly it is my feeling that not a lot of us use enough, and that is uh, the, the uh, part of the prayer book called The Reconciliation of a Penitent. I'm on page 449. I hope you've got a prayer book in your house. If not, you can access the Book of Common Prayer online. I am on page 449, and it, I'm looking at the second form for the Liturgy of Private Confession. You are preparing, perhaps, for your Easter communion. Uh, perhaps it's the Lenten season. Perhaps you're on a Curcio weekend. Perhaps you've had an experience where the 
the, the sinful part of you has suddenly become visible in a way that is alarming, a way that is unsettling and disquieting for you personally. And so you've made an appointment with a priest, and you and the priest are in a room, um, and you're turning to page 449 in the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, I'd just like to say quite something quite personally, and that is that I'm not talking to you as uh, an academic theologian or as a scholar of the prayer book. From now on, I'm talking to you as a person who has been on both sides of this powerful sacramental light. I'm talking to you as a person who has knelt down on my knees before a trusted priest and poured out the truth of my sin. I'm also talking to you as a priest of the church who has had the who has been trusted by baptized Christians with this sacrament who have poured out the truth of their sin to God in my presence and have given me the great and profound and uh, priceless privilege of hearing their confession and of being an instrument and a sacrament of God whose property is always to have mercy. So I'm, this is very experiential for me, this part of our class and I just want you to know that. So together, the priest and the person making a confession would begin, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression only too well, and my sin is ever before me. If that sounds familiar to you, it's from Psalm 51, a psalm that is traditionally associated with King David's confession after he has um, had uh, the uh, affair, after he has been confronted by Nathan as he owns the truth of what he has done before the God that he adores and the God that adores him. And then the penitent and the priest continue, holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy upon us. Now remember, um, the word mercy is related in a cognitive, a cog cognate way to the Hebrew word for womb. It's where we get the word hesed in the Old Testament, but, but there is a relationship between that word and the word womb. When we are begging God's mercy, we are begging that part of God, um, that generative part of God that brought us into being into being. Um, even though the parable is about a father, it could have been equally about a mother, but it's about someone that is adored out of the general generative love, the generating love, the bringing into being love, uh, that is the reason they exist, and therefore they are always coming back to that love. And then the penitent asked the, the minister of the sacrament to pray for me a sinner. And the priest says, may God in his love enlighten your heart that you may remember in truth all your sins. But listen to the next couple of words. And God's unfailing mercy. In other words, it's torture to remember our sins unless we are remembering at the very same instant, at the very same time, at the very same moment, God's un." failing mercy. That's a hugely important affirmation about God. Limitless mercy, unfailing mercy. And from the parable of the prodigal son, I would add uh, consumingly attentive mercy. While he was still at a distance, his father saw him. He saw him because of his consuming mercy. Uh, unfailing mercy. And then, and then the uh, priest who's hearing the confession chooses some words of scripture to encourage the penitent. Uh, and uh, here we use the familiar comfortable words which occupy uh, 
a very important place in Anglican Eucharistic theology. From the first prayer books, they were, they were included as part of the encouragement of the communicant to approach the awesome sacrament of God's very presence. Because of God, uh, invitation, come to me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any <clears throat> one sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Most Episcopalians have been hearing these words over and over and over again. And so the, so the crafters of the prayer book put them, these very familiar words, these very hope filled words in the context of the rite. Then the minister of the sacrament encourages the person about to make a confession with these words. Now in the presence of Christ and of me, his minister, confess your sins with a humble and obedient heart to Almighty God, our Creator and our Redeemer. Now, <clears throat> in the next words that I'm going to read to you, which is the words the penitent says as he begins the confession, as she begins her confession, notice these words. They are pure prodigal son words. They are obviously informed and infused with the story of the prodigal son. Holy God, Heavenly Father, you formed me from the dust in your image and likeness and redeemed me from sin and death by the cross of your son, Jesus Christ. Through the water of baptism, you clothed me with the shining garment of his righteousness and established me among your children in your kingdom. But I have squandered the inheritance of your saints and have wandered far in a land that is waste. The image of <clears throat> sin is the image of wandering, wandering in a waste land. This is also an implicit, if not literal, echo of a phrase that has been occurring in the Book of Common Prayer for a very, very long time since its beginning. We say it in morning prayer. I have erred and strayed from thy ways like a lost sheep. The Hebrew word for sin is a word out of archery. It means to miss the target. It means that our life is not on the trajectory of what God dreams for a human life when God created us. Uh, we're off course. We are, we have we are not on trajectory to hit the target. We are wandering in a wasteland like a lost sheep. We are like a son who has been given an inheritance. We are like a daughter who has been given the glorious white robe of her daughterhood in God's baptismal life, and we have misused it. Uh, and then, having said that generally, then the person says specifically those trespasses that she or he knows that they have done. And they mention whatever it is that is torturing their heart, hurting their relationship with God and with others. And, and here again, what is going on is person making a confession is bringing the symptoms of her wandering far in a land that is waste, what that wandering has looked like in specific ways. And there are all sorts of ways of thinking about what this is. I like to think of it as taking off or unwrapping a wound so that it can be exposed to the healing light, to the air, to the truth of the God whose property 
is always to have mercy. It's one thing to think generally about a God whose nature is to have mercy. It's another thing to be specifically healed by that mercy with the unique and real wounds that I bear as a result of my own erring and my own straying. And so I mention specifically those things that I have done that I know to be wrong. I bring them to the light of truth. I bring them to the light of the truth of the merciful God. In, and as hard as that is to do sometimes, and it, it really is, you know, some very famous person once said the unexamined life is a life not worth living, but that examination is costly. It is costly to admit uh, our own sins and omissions, our own uh, stupidities, our own selfishness, our own, um, our own really wild and woolly and strange wanderings. It's hard to bring them to the light of truth, and yet it is necessary so that God, whose nature is mercy, and we think of that as generally true, it suddenly becomes specifically true and personally true and vividly true when in the presence of another human being who is ordained to listen to my truth and set apart to minister God's mercy to my truth is present. And then after having done that, after having exhausted all of that reality, I remember one time when I was training to be a spiritual director with something called the uh, Shalem Institute, we practiced an Eastern Orthodox form of confession where you mentioned a sin and the person hearing your confession says, amen, God is merciful, and then you mention another sin and the confessor says, amen, God is merciful. You mention another sin. You keep mentioning sins until you're exhausted of any possible uh, thing left to say. And then the last word you hear is, amen, God is merciful. So when you have finished whatever it is that brought you to the moment of confession, you finish with these words. Therefore, O Lord, from these and all other sins I cannot now remember, I turn to you in sorrow and repentance. Here again, an echo of the prodigal parable. Receive me again into the arms of your mercy. Here again, arms are mentioned. That's to remind us of the father embracing the child. The arms of your mercy and restore me to the blessed company of your faithful people. Because you see, my sin doesn't just affect my relationship with the living God. My sin really distorts and impacts and screws up in certain ways my relationship with the community. To the blessed company of your faithful people and through him in whom you have redeemed the world, your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, I plead my case in the power of the Holy Spirit, begging, begging the mercy of God, mercy that has been revealed to us ultimately in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus. And here again, after that, the priest may, but does not have to offer a word of comfort and counsel. Sometimes priests do use that moment. Uh, and I, in, in my experience, certain people that have pastored me in those moments have used words of counsel very, very effectively. Um, but after that little moment where the priest offers comfort and counsel, um, the priest asks the question to the penitent, will you turn again to Christ as your Lord. That's baptismal language. The priest is reminding the uh, penitent that she said in her baptismal vows that she would accept Jesus as Lord. The confession has been the, the acknowledgement that she has not lived under the Lord of Jesus in certain specific ways. And so the priest invites what we call in Greek a metanoia, in English, um, 
repentance, which means a turn, turn again, a turn around towards the love that has always been waiting for us. And then another kind of very, very on the spot question, because remember, sin isn't just about distorting our relationship with God. It also affects our relationship with others. Do you then, this is the hardest question of the whole thing, I think, do you then forgive those who have sinned against you? That's where the rubber hits the road. Um, you know, in, your, in our baptisms, we vow uh, to respect the dignity of every human being. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard to respect the dignity of someone who has hurt us. Uh, probably that's the deepest challenge in that uh, determination to respect dignity. To respect the dignity of someone who is, has caused us personal and real pain is very tricky and very hard. Um, and sometimes when I have heard confessions, and this has been a particularly hard question for the person who's just trusted me with the deep truth, um, I, I gently say to them, um, what you really have to commit to is wanting to eventually be able to do this. To start today that as you have received so much mercy, uh, to start today that process of forgiveness of another person. And um, as a very wise spiritual director once said, when it comes to forgiveness, you can start faking it before you feel it. Uh, and acting forgiving, even if that's not where your heart is, because uh, it is the Christian's experience that uh, by practicing it before we feel it, sometimes our heart catches up. And then the priest, in really wonderful words of assurance, says, May Almighty God in mercy receive your confession of sorrow and faith, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And then the priest says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who has left power to his church to absolve all sinners who truly repent and believe in him, of his great mercy forgive you all your offenses, and by his authority committed to me, I absolve you from all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And before the priest says these words, the rubric gives the priest a direction. Then the priest then lays a hand upon the penitent's head, or extends a hand over the penitent, saying, one of the following absolutions. Uh, I think the hand is important. There is a beautiful moment in uh, one of the Gospels, Transfiguration story, where after Peter and James and John have made the uh, suggestion that three booths be made, uh, fear and trembling seizes them, and in one of the Transfiguration stories, Jesus touches them in their fear and trembling. Sometimes when we have realized and we shine the light of truth on our own behaviors, it can cause a kind of trembling, let's face it. But that hand, that priest's hand, feels at the moment like Jesus' hand. That priest, uh, she becomes the sacrament of Christ's hand for us. And uh, we need sacraments, we're physical people. And uh, the feel of the hand uh, is the sacramental power that's also expressed in the words. So, um, I think in this particular place in the prayer book, we see that the Episcopal Church, the Christian Church, does take sin very, very seriously. We know that it has consequences for our relationship with the living God. We also know that it has consequences for our own relationship with our fellow human beings. Because we believe in the dignity of humanity, because we believe everything we talked about last week about human nature, uh, because a broken relationship with God is distressing, as is a broken relationship with those who also with us bear the image of God, then, uh, then it is important that we apply to our specific symptoms of the one disease we all have, 
And as, as a coronavirus is about to show us that we're one humanity, so I think our sinfulness also shows us we're one humanity. We all have the same disease, we just have different symptoms. In order for us to be healed, we need to bring that, those symptoms into the light of truth, into the light of the truth of God's wider mercy, embracing mercy, and, and to trust Christ who knows us and loves us and knows this part of us to love us to the very depth of that which most troubles us. But not just for our relationship with Jesus, but for our relationship with our fellow members of the human race, our fellow members of the church who share that relationship in Jesus and with us. So uh, having, having said that, I think the other place in the prayer book that I think gives us a really good example of our doctrine, our doctrinal understanding of sin as we pray about our sin in the prayer book, I think another good place to look is both the Ash Wednesday liturgy and the Good Friday liturgy. On Ash Wednesday, we pray the prayer of the song of Excuse me, we pray Psalm 51, David's psalm of confession, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, in your great compassion, blot out my offenses. And we say that together uh, after we've received the ashes. And then the priest invites us to a rather lengthy communal confession of sins. And so we're not alone with the priest in the sacrament of reconciliation. We are gathered um, in a community of sinful people on the first day of Lent, confessing their sin, confessing those realities that in fact cause us to be uh, off target, uh, missing the mark of God's intention in making us the humans in his image that we are. Uh, we can most holy and merciful God, we confess to you. And notice, not just to God, but we've got to confess to each other, the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth, that we have sinned by our own fault, that that sin is manifested in the way we think wrongly, in the way we speak wrongly, and the way we do things that are wrong. Uh, and also by negligence, what we have left undone. This is a great repetitive theme in the confessions, the various forms of confession in the prayer book, we always are made mindful of the fact that there are sins that we absolutely do by act, and then there is sin that we do by not acting, by just not caring enough, by not acting, omission. Uh, we begin, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. If we really believe that those merciful arms have found us like they found the child in the parable of the prodigal, then how dare we not extend the mercy of those uh, arms to our neighbor? Uh, sin is described as deafness in the next petition, and by the way, I'm on page 267. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served. We've not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. This is a very, a very serious uh, recounting of the distance that our sin can, um, can cause. And if we were baptized into the name, if we were baptized into the very inner life of God, then the truth of our sin uh, hurts that love bond that we share with the Holy Trinity, and the Trinity is affected by our sin. That is a huge, uh, a huge thing to admit. Uh, we confess on Ash Wednesday our past unfaithfulness. We confess pride, hypocrisy, and impatience. Some spiritual directors in the past, some of the great fathers and mothers of the church, call those the cold sins. They would call something like adultery a warm sin. Uh, that kind of a sin, you sort of know it very clearly in its warmth. 
and it's in its present power. But there are other sins that are sometimes harder to know because they're cold. They're not, they're not, uh, we have to dig a little deeper into our soul to discover our hypocrisy, our pride, and our impatience. We confess self-indulgent appetites and ways in our exploitation of other people. We confess anger at our own frustration, and, and that leads to envy of those more fortunate, which takes a tremendous amount of psychic energy and takes psychic energy away from the claiming of our identity as beloved daughters and sons, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failings to commend the faith that is in us. Uh, one very wise person said that all sin is adult idolatry. It's always finding another God that feels more energizing, more proximate, more available, more immediate, uh, the golden calf in our various wildernesses that gives us just a little juice when we feel like we need it. Uh, and then we ask God to accept our repentance, our metanoia, our moving away from all that causes us a kind of soulful paranoia to a metanoia. We confess wrongs we have done. We will confess blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, false judgment, uncharitable thoughts towards the neighbor, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us where we have denied the very image of God in other human beings. Uh, interestingly enough, don't forget the prayer book was written in the early 70s, authorized in, at the convention of 1976, and, and then re-ratified and made permanent in the convention of 1979. So it's the 79 prayer book. But notice what we confess next. Our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Environmental concerns were alive and well in the 70s. And the unfortunate thing is they've become so politicized in the last 40 years that we forget that uh, at a time where they were less politicized, we could actually acknowledge that concern for creation uh, as, as incumbent upon the faithful person and a lack of concern for creation, uh, a lack of concern for those who come after us, a lack of stewardship of the crea creation was in a less politically charged time clearly seen as, uh, as sinful, as distancing us from God and God's purpose. Uh, in, uh, but I point out to you when this was written. And then we pray that we would be restored, that the God would accomplish in us the work of God's salvation, and that by the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, we would be brought with all your saints to the joy of the resurrection. Uh, I, I have illustrated all of this to show you the sort of expansive, expansive notion of what sin entails that's in the Book of Common Prayer. So with these thoughts in mind, as we pray, so we believe. Does the Episcopal Church take sin seriously? Yes. It's just not the evangelical Christians that talk about, are you, are you washed in the blood? We know as Episcopalians that the cross of Jesus Christ, given the truth of our sinfulness, is our only hope. However, we know at the same instant that we were made out of love and for love. We know what Luther said in his famous Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator. And that in English is at every moment justified and at every moment we are in fact a sinner. And uh, I think that's the moment that the prodigal felt in the prodigal's parents' arms. And that can be your, you can understand the parable with a metaphor of a father or with a mother or with a grandmother or with your best friend who is a sacrament of God's love. But when we are held in those arms, yes, the truth of our sinfulness is real. The pain of having caused distance is real. But those arms also remind us that we are literally and always and forever loved to death and beyond death, loved to a life beyond weep.
that which we can imagine. So uh, those are my thoughts about how the prayer book teaches the reality of the doctrine of sin, but in the larger context of the fact that we were made in God's image and the fact that uh, through our baptism into Christ and through the power of the cross and the empty tomb, we always can come back to the love that has made us and to the love that has redeemed us and to the love that is waiting for us with an alert urgency, which gives us hope. Thank you.